All right, good morning. If you have your Bibles, please turn to the book of Acts, chapter number 26. The title of today's sermon will be called The Hope to Come. If you have your Bibles, please, Acts, chapter number 26. The Apostle Paul here is in defense of his position uh, before the Jews. He has been called into question regarding, as he says, the hope. And today I want to discuss with you what that hope is and why in, in our life we should be consumed with hope. Acts chapter 26, Agrippa, uh, who Paul has gone before as a result of a, a hierarchy in his appellate process in, in the court system, uh, Agrippa gets up to Paul and he says, thou art permitted to speak for thyself. So he's asking him to defend what's been going on. The brief history of it is the Jews have been absolutely nonstop to kill Paul, to, to make him no longer speak. Uh, they, they believe that he is not speaking the words of God and that he's actually contrary to God. So Paul, he stretched forth his hands, and he does answer for himself. So this whole appellate process, which is pretty awesome, Paul ends up getting here and saying the following. He says, I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because I shall answer for myself this day before thee, touching all the things whereof I am accused of the Jews. Has anybody ever been accused of something and you were definitely not wrong? It's one of the worst feelings. It's, there's few things that I can't stay more when somebody accuses you of something, you're like, no, I didn't, I didn't do that at all. Like, well, I heard that you did this and that. So, no, I didn't. And you immediately come to that defensive position. And so Paul says, I'm happy to stand before you today, and I'm gladly going to answer, and I will touch all the things by which they're accusing me. What's going to be awesome about this accusation process is Paul knows that King Agrippa has a good understanding of the Jews' religion. He's very familiar with what happens. He's heard it before. He's very engaged in that culture. And as a result, he says, especially because I know thee to be an expert in all customs and questions which are among the Jews, wherefore I beseech thee to hear me patiently. My manner of life from my youth which was at the first among my own nation at Jerusalem, know all the Jews, which knew me from the beginning, if they would testify that after the most straightest sect of our religion, I lived a Pharisee. All of that is just for him to build a foundation. He's saying, these guys, they know who I am. I grew up with them. They're very familiar with what I taught and what I, what, what I was my, my history, if you would, and their main issue, the main problem that they're questioning is something that they themselves also believe. And that is in verse number six, and he says, and now I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made of God unto our fathers. Think about that. He's being charged with simply giving the Jews hope. He's saying, I, I, this hope, is the resurrection of the dead. That's really what he's going to tell you in just a second. He says this, Unto which promise our twelve tribes instantly serving God day and night, comma, hope to come. I don't know if you've ever dealt with anybody who's gone through a very severe or traumatic situation. Um, and then sometimes they just go, oh, they just, geez, they're hopeless. They've lost all hope. And maybe you've been there in your own life. I've been through several situations in my life. I've definitely have not, not lost all of it, but I've come close to losing a lot of hope, right? And so in that process, the renewing of your mind, and we can say, it's just so easy. You just get your spiritual mindset, and then you just, you just everything goes back to the way you should be. And I think sometimes we, we, we fail to appreciate the God-given emotional state that we have. And then we have trouble sometimes formulaically coming back to the appreciation for things. Okay, well, I'm, I'm worried about this future event. I'm worried about what could take place in the future. And all of a sudden, you just you can't see the hope of the end of whatever situation could occur. So today, I want to show you that there is a formula for hope, that there is a mental formula, but then there's a practical formula as well, or there's a physical formula that must be played out. So you can't just say this is all just strictly mental, because I'll tell you what, what if you just want to learn about hope, guess what? You ain't going to get hope. And you go, oh, 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 I don't understand. You don't get hope just by learning about hope, okay? I can't give you a book and say, here's the book on hope. You just read this, and at the end of the day, you'll have lots of hope. The Bible does not teach that that's how you get hope. 
The hope of the promise made of the fathers is the hope of eternal life. As Paul says in the book of Titus, he says, the hope of eternal life which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. He says that for hope's sake, he was accused. Notice this in verse 2. He says, wherefore I am accused of the Jews. And what is that he is accused of? He says, I now stand and am judged for the hope of the promise. Of all the things that you could be accused of, I want to tell you that's one that you should be accused of. Among your friend circle, among your colleagues, among strangers. Todd and I have had this discussion many times about what we should do in, in our approach to the gospel message with people we interact with. And so many times the generic statement is, are you saved? <laughs> you know, it's like, what does that even mean, right? I think many people if not all, if they're honest, are looking for hope. And here's the reason I say that. The Apostle Paul says that if in this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. I want you to think about that passage again. If in this life we have hope in Christ, if it's just in this life, we are of all men most miserable. The dissection of that means this. All men are miserable. You got that? At what point in time did you guys realize that in your life? Have you guys not realized it yet? <laughs> Pretty sure you all have, right? For me, I think it was probably about 25, 26 years old. I started seeing the world for what it really was, and I was kind of like, okay, okay, you guys are miserable. <laughs> You're miserable. You're miserable, right? You guys just down the bottom of the bottle every night. Okay, you're doing, you know, whatever it might be, I started to see just more reality of what the world was. And so for hope's sake, I too would like to be accused simply by saying in the evangelistic process like Todd and I have discussed, I'm just trying to give you some hope. Does anybody not want that? I think really that they do, okay? And they'll look for hope in various areas, but the hope that we're going to provide is a hope that is found in base in truth. Now, Paul says here in verse number six, I now stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made of God unto our fathers. Notice what he said. Unto which promise are 12 tribes instantly serving God day and night, hope to come. And if you study out through the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, at the very end of, like, let's say Luke chapter 24, right? Uh, the, the, those that are on the road to Emmaus, right? Christ looks at them and he says, what's going on? And they said, we, we hoped it would have been he. We hoped it was going to be he that redeemed Israel, and all this is the third day, and it's, it's over, you know? See, they lost their hope. In the very beginning of, of the book of Luke, I like to use Luke as one of the books we use a lot when we discuss Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, because it's a treatise, right? And Luke has a very intimate knowledge of it, and it's, very, it's much more detailed than sometimes some of the other accounts. But early on with Zacharias, right? And then you have Simeon. You have all these other ones who were looking for redemption in Israel. They were looking for that hope. They, they hoped in a future event to take place, okay? What is our hope in the future event? What is our future event? Heavenly hope. Heavenly hope. When Paul says, set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth, Right? Well, how do we do that? How, how do we really, I want to tell you today, how, I want to teach you how, you how the Bible explains how you get hope, okay? Because it's probably, probably a little different than, than you may want to, want to hear, but it's, it's a formula. First thing here, Paul says, he goes, uh, unto the promise of the 12 tribes serving God day and night, hope to come, for which hope's sake, King Agrippa, I am accused of the Jews, why should it be thought a thing incredible with you that God should raise the dead? What was the number one issue that Paul dealt with the Jews on as it relates to Jesus Christ? Pharisees and Sadducees. Pharisees and Sadducees did what? Pharisees believed in the resurrection. The Sadducees did not, right? And that's the joke is they're Sadducee because why would they even live their life? Because there's no resurrection. But the reality of the truth of Jesus being raised from the dead creates the accountability process vindicates all the words that he had said, right? And so the moniker that said, behold, the king of the Jews standing above him, well, hey, he is the king of the Jews, that he has been given a name that is above every name, that the name of Jesus Christ, every knee shall bow. 
and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Paul, talking about this hope, he says, it is for the hope, in Acts chapter 28 and verse 20, it is for the hope of Israel that he is bound with the chain. If you remember back in the book of Acts chapter 21 and 22, he says he's ready not only to be bound, but he's also ready to die for the name of Jesus Christ. He says, I go into Jerusalem not knowing the things that shall befall me, but I don't even care. He says, I don't even count my life dear unto myself. Wow. I don't know if I'm, I'm there. Definitely not. Okay, I do count my life, unfortunately, dear to myself. But there is a learning process that Paul has gone through, and he teaches us not only the mental state of this hope, but then the physical state or the practical state of this hope. I mean, imagine that you're actually bound with a chain because you were giving people hope. And that's when he gets before King Agrippa, right? And if you actually look at his whole history from, you know, Paul sent to Rome, and then he's over before Paul appears, appeals to Caesar, and then, I mean, all this stuff before Felix, they all kind of do the same thing that Pontius Pilate do. They're kind of like, I mean, what's the big deal with this guy? Why? I didn't find any fault in him. What was the problem? What is the issue that really is, is creating all of this, you know, this, this distrust and this, you know, major, you know, basically the dilemmas, if you would. And, you know, King, King Agrippa, you know, is, is, is being told about the resurrection of the dead, as he says there in verse number 8 of chapter 26, why should it be thought a thing incredible with you that God should raise the dead? Then he goes on to tell about his history of his persecution of, um, of the believers, right? So the hope that, that God should raise the dead is not a big thing. Peter himself was talking about that hope way back in the book of Acts, chapter number 2, that, that the flesh shall rest in hope that God, look at, look at those verses I don't know if you're familiar with them, I, I quote verses many times just thinking you guys have the same memory as I do and I just anticipate you guys are all just oh yeah I know that verse, no problem I do it to my mom sometimes when her and I are having our little Bible discussions and she's like okay hold on, hold on, hold on, what, what verse again? <laughs> so she does to me all the time I go okay I got you but in Acts chapter 2 and if you read in verse number uh 28 he says actually I'm going to go back a little further let's go back to, to, to 2 verse 20, uh, 24 he says whom God hath raised up having loosed the pains of death this is Peter speaking to the men of Israel because it was not possible that he should be holden of it for David speaketh concerning him I foresaw the Lord always before my face for he is on my right hand that I should not be moved therefore did my heart rejoice Ooh, I'm going to show you. This is some of the formula for hope. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope. You ever just get in a negative mood? And you just go, everything's negative. It doesn't matter. It's just, it's just all downhill. I'm going to give you an example. I was fishing with a friend of ours, and uh, his girlfriend's not the most positive person. And uh, it was super early, and we wear these things called bibs, and bibs are like, they look like slickers, or like, uh, you know, snow bibs almost. They're, they're, they're for the water not to come, come on you, like a rain suit almost, right? So, because when it's windy or it's rainy or if it's rough and you're getting water on you, you want to stay dry. And so we get to the boat at 4 o'clock in the morning. It's super early. We're unpacking everything. We're pulling away. And I'm getting, we usually, as we're going through, I'm putting my slickers on, doing the whole thing. And my buddy's girlfriend goes, ah, where are my slickers? And I go, I, 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 I don't know. I, I don't know. It's only three people on the boat, myself, my buddy, and his girlfriend. That was our, that was our team. And so he goes, I, 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 don't, I didn't see them. I, they, they have to be here somewhere. She's like, well, we have to find the slickers. I said, okay, okay. So we start looking. We're trying to find the slickers. And we, we can't find them, right? We just can't find them. We don't know where they are. We can't find them. So my buddy says, hey, you know what? I'll just give you my slickers. I have another pair of pants. I can just wear those, and I'll wear my jacket. You can wear the slickers. And she goes, no, I'm not wearing them. And I'm like, uh-oh, this is it. This is the descent, right? This is how it starts. <laughs> and I know how the rest of the day is going to go. And when I tell you that was one of the most miserable days I've ever been on a boat, and it started just with that one little thing, right? One little piece, and it just goes in that native piece. So what I'm going to say is this. When in your life... You recognize and realize that there is something that is a trigger that starts to make you lose hope 
or get frustrated about your hope or, or, or just not even think about that, you need to be very quick to do the following things. Look what Paul says here, or Peter says here about David. He says, therefore did my heart rejoice. A joyful heart is what? It's medicine. How, do you have, how can you have a joyful heart? The only way you can do that is you first need to, and I, I do this all the time, and you may think this is crazy, I talk to myself. <laughs> does anybody else do that? Or am I the only one? Yes. I, think he does. I mean, I'm negative in myself sometimes. Yeah. I mean, oh, man, sometimes I just beat up Jason. But, you know, for the most part, I find myself doing it very often. I'll be sitting there having a conversation. I've actually been talking, like, while I'm rigging something, and a neighbor walks by, and, what? I'm like, oh, no, I'm just talking to myself. You know, and they're like, you okay? You know, I promise I'm okay. But that internalization is actually what I would consider to be a form of prayer. It's a form of intercession that you have with God and because it's, it's, your, it's like your new man and your old man and having this, this basically this reconciliation process. But Paul, Paul, or Peter says that my tongue was glad, and as a result of having a, a joyful heart and having a, a tongue that's glad, your, your flesh shall also rest in hope because he's thinking about the end of himself, which everybody always does, right? I mean, you can't, you can't drive around without just seeing death. We drove around the other day, and the kids saw we, we were driving down 49th Street, over here, this way, we went down Park, went up 49th Street, and we passed that huge um, graveyard, right? The cemetery there. And I'm like, that thing's huge. 54th. 54th, right? I mean, it's massive. And Chloe's like, are, are there all dead people in there? I'm like, oh, yeah. <laughs> lots of bodies. Lots of them. Just stacking them up, you know? And it's just, it's it nonstop. And then I just, then I'm driving, and then, you know, I, I, see, I see a squirrel get run over. Oh, there's some more death, right? It's just, it's everywhere you look, you see more death, more death, more death. So when Paul says, if in, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, the whole purpose of, of why Christ died on the cross for our sins is not to just let you have this nice, peachy, keen, keen, easy life while you're on earth. And this is how you develop the second phase of your hope. I know you're interested to hear this. I promise you, it's, it's very good. In Acts chapter number 2, in verse number 28, he says this, or 27, Because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Now, this is, this is very deep information. This is a prophetical piece, and I've preached on this a long time, but basically it is a prophecy about the Lord Jesus Christ from the mouth of David, and David also being a very much a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's very interesting if you look at all the typologies of individuals, like Joseph is a type of Christ, and Moses is a type of Christ, and David is a type of Christ. And it says, you will, thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Think about that again. David is saying, thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou, notice this, shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. If you want to have joy, if you want to know the ways of life, it's only going to come from God. I've said this so many times, I'm probably a broken record. There's no way man wrote this book. There's no possible way. It's, it's impossible. When you read the, like the verse in Hebrews 4.12, right, that the word of God is quick and powerful and it's sharper than any two edges sword, piercing even the dividing center of soul and spirit, of the joints and marrow, of the thoughts and the intentions of the heart, you read that and go, wow, yeah, it's true, very true. The, 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 the cutting edge of what the scripture can do into the heart of a man, and that's what I say about the hope to somebody, if I provide them with that hope and they reject it, right, why do they do that? And we'll talk about that in just a second. Let's talk about the formula. The formula for hope, the mentally versus the practically. First, you have to find the truth. Hard in today's day and age? Yes. Very hard in today's day and age. Finding the promises of the truth, when you look at this Bible, you go, well, where do I start? Right? And we all know what we would say to start. Go read the book of Romans, right? We say, read Romans until you, you get so sick of it and you know, every, you know it backwards and forwards, up and down. Then, just because you find the promises of truth, what's your second step? You then have to believe them. You have to actually believe the promises of truth. And then the third part is the living with the constant expectation of that fulfillment. In other words, the spiritual understanding of your position. In other words, it's already happened, right? That's why Paul says, if you then be risen with Christ, what do you mean I'm not risen with Christ? I'm still dead in my flesh. I, I mean, am I actually risen? Am I not risen? Am I translating the kingdom of his dear son? Am I not? Do I have all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ? Do I not? 
right? You have this like constant, like, I'm tell they're telling me this, but I'm feeling a totally different way. But then you go, well, you don't understand. I've had a tough life, okay? I'm sure you have. I know lots of people. I talked to a guy this week. I sat down. He's one of my, one of my clients, known for a very long time. We've worked together, and I've actually never met him. Probably worked with him for 15 years. Isn't that crazy? Lives in a different state. Never met the guy. We Skype. We do phone calls. But I've never met him in 15 years. And I'm telling you, we've probably done a lot of money in business together, right? Crazy to think that you can do that in today's digital age, but that's, that's what we do. So he says he wants to take me to dinner. I said, that's fine. Let's go to dinner. So we start having a conversation. I asked him if his wife was going to come. He said, no, she wasn't feeling well. He proceeds to kind of tell me a little bit about his wife's story, how she fell into a houseboat and messed up her leg and then messed up her back and had a spinal, um, they call them like spinal stimulators put in and has like massive nerve issues, and massive, just massive, massive, massive issues. And he said, it's just amazing how just one step changed my entire life, right? Because it's not just her life that it changed, it was his entire life. And so I took the time and we, we spent four hours at dinner and you, can you guess what I talked about? Can, you, can anybody make a guess? Football, no, no, no. You can bet 100% we talked about these issues right here. And we spent that time going through all the information, all the verses, and I, you know, I said, listen, I don't know where you stand on most of the stuff. He ended up being a believer. And I said, I'm, uh, he goes, I basically wouldn't be able to get through with it without being a believer, right? And I gave him, I gave him you know, our, our YouTube channel, and I said, here's some stuff I preached on Romans chapter 8, that if you're, hit, you're really in the lowest spot, Here's, here's where you go. But I will say this. You know, you don't understand everybody and what they're going through. You don't understand all of their life and all the different problems and, and situations. But let's look at Romans chapter number 5 because the formula, as I said, is not just you have to know this, right? If you just believe this, you got hope. That's all you got to do. No, unfortunately, there is an experience part of, of the development of hope in your life. In Romans chapter number 5, and verse number 1, I'll just read you. Paul, Paul says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, we glory in tribulations also. Okay. Can we just stop for a second? I don't do that very good. I'm not a good glorying in tribulations. You know what I do? I get angry. I don't have a lot of patience. I'm not a patient person. I'm, I'm much more patient than I was five years ago. But I'm learning about patience. I'm learning about it. I, I'm, I'm patiently trying to be patient. But Paul says, we don't only glory in the hope of the, hope of the glory of God. He says, but we also rejoice. He says this, and not only so, but we glory in tribulations also. Notice this. People want hope. Okay, here's how you get it. Knowing that tribulation worketh patience. And patience experience and experience hope. Can we just skip all that? We just want the hope part. Can anybody attest to how that formula works in their life? I can. I can tell you stories. I won't do it on the recorder, but I'll tell you stories after the fact, and you'll go, wow. You know, things that have happened, stuff that's gone on, crazy situations of tribulation. And then going through it, I would go, I don't, I, I, I'll never take I want it. I, I would never take that back. Because what that process taught me was it developed an, ex ex an experience, if you would, that, of course, you know, people tell you, you don't know, if you're, you're, I'm going to tell you about that. Listen, until you go through it yourself, there's just not an appreciation for what happens. So that hope that I developed, I would never have the same degree of hope. And when we talk about the guys who are in prison all the time, why are they so interested and eager to, to, to gravitate toward the gospel message, Right? Because they've been through everything, right? The ups, the downs, the, you know, I'm in prison, you know? 
great, what do you got? So they're looking for a hope, whereas the majority of the world sits in their own way, in a way, lying to themselves, and as Paul says, just being miserable. Now the hope, as he says, hope maketh not ashamed. Paul is a great example of an individual who took his hope and was not bashful with his hope, right? Let's look at some examples. Hold your place here in Romans 5. Let's talk about Paul here in 2 Corinthians chapter number 3 or 4 and what Paul says about his life, about the ministry of suffering that he had and the hope that he developed. Verse 8. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. You ever heard that the term like despondent or despair? That's You just have nothing. I'm going underneath the Sunshine Skyway. I do it all the time this time of the year. It's my number one place where I'm fishing for tarpon. It's just amazing. They have the new lights up there and everything. And one of the other things they're putting up right now, suicide nets. They got nets that are 10 feet high so that people can just climb those and then jump a little higher from the top of the bridge, right? <laughs> I mean, that's really what, I mean, it's not going to stop them. I'll tell you that right now. It's not even possible. Those nets are not going to, people can, you can climb the net, no problem, you just, you just jump a little further, right? So I look at those nets and, and, and it's always, I feel like there's a, it's always a good time for me to just have that spiritual discussion. Every person I take out, like, what, what's going on with those nets? tell you about those nets and then I have this discussion with people and the amount of spiritual conversations that have been on my boat as it relates to those you know that bridge and those nets you know it's a uh, you know using if you would the opportunities right that are in front of you to then know how you ought to answer every man so when Paul says we're troubled on every side but we're not distressed he's not he, I mean of course you could have trouble you're always you're gonna have the trouble but you're not going to be distressed to the point where you don't know what to do. You're not going to get to the point where you're so perplexed that you finally just end up in a state of despair and despondency with absolutely no hope. He says, we're persecuted, of course, but we're not forsaken. He says, we're cast down, yes, but we're not destroyed. He's always thinking about what? He's that hope, that hope, that hope that he has. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be manifest in our body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. Paul spends a year and a half with the church at Corinth, giving them these very detailed pieces of information, right? And yet at the same time, they still are so immature. Remember he says, I cannot, I could not feed you with meat because you were not able to bear it. People are just trying to figure out the basics of the gospel, right? Just figuring out the basics of hope. Then to get through life and how to function as a, as a you know, mature believer is something that really evade most individuals. And I've said it repeatedly that it is so nice that I don't have to wait another year to become more spiritually mature. You don't have to like, okay, I have my birthday, now I'm a little bit older, right? Like the government says, now you hit this age and you can do this, and now you hit this age and you can do that, right? 21, you can drink alcohol, okay, you know? 18, you can vote and you can go to war, you know? Okay, great, right? 25, and guess what? Your car insurance goes down a little bit. Whatever it might be, whatever number, the nice thing about the spiritual maturity is it, it, it can be done rapidly. I mean, you, you could dive into this and, and start going with the process, now, the experiential piece, unfortunately, will be something that you'll deal with your entire life. How long that life will be? I think you guys should stop worrying so much because Paul says, or Christ says, like, uh, like Russ said this morning, which one of you, by th taking thought for the morrow, or for tomorrow, can add one cubit unto your stature, right? It's such a great passage of scripture. It's so profound. And Paul, uh, Russ said the word introspection today. He's like, it's introspective. He's telling them to get inside their head and say, which one of you, by taking thought for the moral, can add one cubit under your stature? The experiential piece here of Paul's life in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 
he says in verse 12, so then death worketh in us, but life in you. In other words, he's like, I'm so persecuted, but I'm doing this all for your sake, for your benefit, to make you have a better life. I want you to experience the, what, you know, what, what it is to be in Christ Jesus, right? So then Paul goes on to say, we having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believed and therefore have I spoken. We also believe and therefore speak. Knowing Remember what I talked to you about finding the promises of truth, believing these truthful promises, right? He says, knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus, notice this, shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you. For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God, for which cause we faint not. But though our outward man perish, oh, I'm feeling it, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. Verse 17, first time I read it, you know, I, I kind of was a little frustrated because I said, I don't, I don't think he understands. I don't have a light affliction. I have a heavy affliction. I have a heavy burden. I have a massive situation I'm dealing with. But Paul says, no, no, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, when you put it into the perspective and you recognize that it is just a temporary problem. It's a temporary situation. There's no permanency to it. How many people I've helped just by telling them that? They're like, yeah, but you don't understand. I got this. this. Yeah, it's temporary. It's a temporary situation. But you don't understand. I, no, no, I do. I've been through a lot. And that's a temporary situation. And they're like, yeah, I guess, I guess you're kind of right. It is a temporary situation. And telling yourself that that it is. It worketh, notice this, our light affliction, which is but for a moment, moment, worketh for us. How does it work for us? As I told you, the experiential piece of Romans 5 teaches us that tribulation, which we glory in, it worketh patience, patience experience, and experience hope. It worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. And I love that verse because I want you to read that again. He says, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. Do you see what he's saying there? You're looking at things that are not seen. You're actually looking at the things that, that nobody's seeing. And I so many times say, I'm in complete isolation. I feel like I'm in between besides a few, you know, the guys in this group today. But I feel like I walk around and go, you guys have no clue what's going on. You're not seeing what's happening. You're not seeing the world for what it really is. You're not seeing the truth of the scripture. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, because we walk by faith and not by sight, he says, for the things which are seen are... Everything you see is temporal. It'll all go away at some point in time. But the things which are not seen are, are eternal. I'd love to read you all these next couple verses, but we only have a handful of minutes left. So in the glorying of the tribulation that we experience in Romans chapter 5, he says that the patience experience and experience hope, Romans 5, 5, he says, and hope maketh not ashamed. If you've developed some degree of hope in your life, hopefully you share that hope with other people. Because the more I think about my life and what keeps me going and what when I get up in the morning and why I continue to do what I do, it's for, as Paul says, the hope of our calling. That I really do believe it. I don't know if you guys do, but I do. And I, I do believe that one day we will have a face-to-face -face meeting with the God who created us. Like, yeah. Like, oh yeah, face-to-face. -face. You, you will know even as you are known, right? You will not look dimly through the glass, but you will understand and see God for who he is. That hope maketh not ashamed. And notice this, why? Because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure, or if by chance, for a good man some would even dare to die. But God, 
commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we now receive the atonement. Let's finish out by going to the book of Philippians, if you would. And looking at what Paul says about the formula for this hope-filled life. Finding the promises of truth, believing those truthful promises, living with the constant expectation of the fulfillment, that spiritual understanding of your position that it has already occurred, so that in the day-to-day, from a practical perspective, how do we do that? What do we then do, if you would? Right? What do we do? We talked about what to believe, now what do we do? Paul says this, first and foremost, let your moderation in verse 5, actually let's start in verse number 4, rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice, that's, that's number 1, start there, this is Philippians 4.4, 4. rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice, things you can do, second, let your moderation be known unto all men, the Lord is at hand, <laughs> I like that one, short time here. You know, I truly believe Paul in his lifetime thought that Christ was returning before his death. But it's fitting, of course, that the dispensation of the grace of God would extend for as long as it extends because where sin did abound, as we can see so much, grace did much more abound. Paul writes on here in verse 6, Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding. It doesn't pass your understanding. It passes the world's understanding. That they can't see how you could get through fill in the blank. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And here it is. You ready for the verse? This is the verse. If you don't have it memorized, you better go home and just read this thing until you get... It's so ingrained in your head. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, if the God who cannot lie promised eternal life before the world began and he gave you the scripture, don't you think that probably the thing that if you're going to spend the most time right on, he's talking about that you're supposed to be thinking on these things, the things that are true, the things that are honest? Shouldn't you be looking at that scripture? Now, this gets really fun because people go, well, I don't know how much I should read the Bible every day. Do I read it for five minutes, for 20 minutes, for 15 minutes, for 30 minutes? I'd rather you read it for two minutes and actually get something out of it and hold on to it for the rest of the day than you sit there for 30 minutes and go, okay, and timer started, reading, I'm thinking about something else, and I'm done. 30 minutes is done. I read it for 30 minutes today. Great. I'd rather read it for 45 seconds and get something to gravitate and hold on to for the whole day and take it with you then just read it for 30 minutes to check off a box. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do. And the God of peace shall be with you. You want to have the hope and peace? Follow that formula. Finishing out in verse 10, he says, But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last your care of me has flourished again. Here's a really good point. You're not in this life alone. As fellow members of the body of Christ, you have care for the body one for another. Right? See how this works? Paul says, I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last your care of me has flourished again. If somebody in the body needs the help, you need to be there to provide them with the help. That help may just be financially. Some people, they just need some money for something. It might be spiritual help. They have, if every man is be overtaken in a fall, him that the spiritual restore such an one. It may be a carnal issue. 
It may be a sin issue. It might be a whole litany of issues. It might just be an emotional issue that they're having. It might be a mental issue. Whatever it might be, if you have care one for another for the body, it is so refreshing. How refreshing is it when you talk to somebody and you say, hey, I want to give you some hope, talk about the gospel. And they're like, oh, I know the gospel. And then they give you the gospel. You're like, wow, this is great. I never run into this. This is so rare. Your care of me hath flourished again, wherein you were also, notice this, careful, but you lacked that opportunity. Not that I speak in respect of one. For I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. Learning wherever you are, with whatever you have, to be content. And Paul says, remember, just like everything, when you have the experience, that's how you learn the best. I know how to be abased because he was. I know how to abound because he had abounded. Everywhere and in all things, I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. And then one of the most famous verses, probably right behind John 3.16, is Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. What really strengthens you? It's God. That will supply all of your needs. How many of them? He will supply all of your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. I hope today that you can look at this scripture, use the formula that is, that is laid out to provide yourself with some hope. Because as I said, when I wake up in the day, you know what I'm looking for? The hope, always. Renewing that mind. The faster I can do it, the better I can have a better day, right? When I start getting super carnal, oh, it's just it's bad news. You know, you just, it's the slow fade right down into the abyss of just being angry and frustrated. And so developing the, these uh, formulas to think on the things that Paul talks about and the God of peace us be with you, I hope today that you can also use this and it'll be beneficial to you. So we're 41 minutes in. Let's close in prayer.